It's such a wonderful source. It's such a great thrill to come back here once again for the Kirsten lecture. As Mr. Kirsten mentioned, I love Joe. He was everybody's uncle Joe. And I, I still remember the best compliment that I ever got from him. I had finished a lecture, must have been about seven or eight years ago, and I just came down off the podium and he said, don't forget, you're coming back next year. I said, don't you want to think about it? You know, maybe you'll get somebody else. And he said, no, you're a better speaker than Bill Clinton. <laughs> and you know, with this election, I'm happy he didn't say Hillary. <laughs> it is such a thrill to see Michael, to see Aaron, and to meet their father and grandfather who we met before at Patricia. This year, I had the great host to work for the first time with Shlomo Romberg and Shoshana Mason. I am so, I tell you, it just occurred to me, her name should be amazing, not just Shoshana Mason, she's amazing. She is so efficient, together with Shlomo, they are such an extraordinary team. And it's just remarkable, there's no question that they're taking over the role of running this lecture and running so much that they do in a time can only be to the enhancement of this great school. And I thank you both for your wonderful work. <laughs> somebody that's been very close to me over the years, she's the one who really introduced me to Joe Kirstner, and that's Gloria Silver. She's here tonight, and I just want to thank her for all the I'd like to thank Elias Levy, who's very humble and doesn't want me to mention him, so I won't say much about him. But thank you for being here on the And I'll tell you the truth, when I came to Patricia this afternoon and I saw Rabbi Shlomo Schwartz, I almost fainted. Because I haven't been at Passaic in the last few months, I had no idea that he left. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen his children. They, besides my grandchildren, they're the cutest kids at Passaic. <laughs> And all these little guys, they would just stand right in front with their chumashim and their sudurim, and they are like little, wonderful angels. It's, it's unbelievable. And of course, how could you not compliment them? They sat right in front, they don't leave in the middle of laning, they don't talk, they're just wonderful. And Rav Shlema, I wish you tremendous, tremendous aslof in your new role, and it's time, and it's time should grow out of which means just to be extraordinary. We've come tonight as we celebrate the beginning of the centennial year of Eitz Chaim, if you can believe it. Eitz Chaim was created just about a hundred years ago. And if you think about it, the amount of students that walk through the portals of Eitz Chaim, it's got to be thousands, it could even be a hundred thousand. It, it, it's just absolutely incredible. All, all the children the young men, the young women who have made such a difference in Toronto, who have made such a difference in Palau Yisrael all the years. It's just such a beautiful thing. I remember the first time that I spoke in a time of Rishmol Jacobowitz had brought me to some of the classes and I spoke to the boys and I spoke to the girls. It's just an absolute delight to see how a school grows in such a way. And it occurred to me something very interesting. You know, one of the most sensitive parts of Shimon Esrei is minded when we say thank you. And it once occurred to me, we know that every Jewish letter, every letter of the Jewish alphabet has a numerical equivalent. Those of you who are familiar, you can write down the word moitin, mem, vav, dalad, yud, mem. You know how much that's equal? It's equal 100. I always thought, why is moitin equal 100? You know why? Because you have to thank Hashem 100%. Everything that you have 100%, you have to thank Him. But tonight it has a new meaning. Tonight we all say Moedim. We thank Hashem for a hundred years of Eitz Chaim. And that's special. And all of you, especially the Kirsteners, the Rothschilds and others, have supported this great school over the years. Hashem should bless you with Nachas and Mazel. I just told Aaron one day he's going to be up here. I don't know if he'll introduce my son. I hope he'll still be introducing me. But uh, it, it, it's just a beautiful legacy, a family legacy of supporting Jewish education, Hashem should bless all of you. I'll just tell you the most beautiful story that I know about Eitz Chaim. Not about the school, but something that happened with a little boy. 
he was 10 years old when this happened. And he was in England, and he was walking with his Rebbe. They were walking in a park. It was in autumn. The leaves were beautiful, orange, brown, green, and red. And one of the leaves fell off the tree as they were walking and it landed on a park bench. And the Rebbe turns to the little boy and he says, look at that leaf. That leaf thinks it's free. That leaf thinks it can fly wherever it wants. But he doesn't realize that in two, three days he's going to wither and die. He said, you know why? Because he's no longer connected to the tree. And he said, my child, I want you to remember this. That when you get older, you're going to see all kinds of Jews. And some of them are not going to be connected anymore to Torah. They're going to say, I can drive what I want, I can watch what I want, I can do what I want. But just know that if they're not connected to that tree, to the Eitz Chaim, which is the tree of life, which is really the Torah, then the generations will fall aside. And that made such an impression on that little boy. That little boy grew up to be Ramatisio Salman. The Mashkiach and Lake, he told me the story himself. And when I met him a few years ago, and I reminded him of the story, and I asked him, who was that really? He said, oh, it's so long ago, I don't remember anymore. He said, but I remember the lesson. And that lesson is to hold on to the eight Chaim. And that's what the Toronto community has done all these years. To hold on to eight Chaim, Hashem should bless each and every one of you, that your generations should be those that are totally committed to Yiddishkeit and that we should all merit to see Mashiach in our time. Amen. Many of you know that there was a great tzaddik, a genius. His name was Rav Aaron Salvechik. All the Salvechiks are geniuses. And this Rav Aaron Salvechik, who was in Chicago for many years, the Rosh Hashiva and Skoki, the Brisk Yeshiva, when he was a little boy, he was six years old, he was saying slichas. He was saying those extra prayers that we say during that service to Chuba with his uncle, who was Rab Elia Prusiner, Rab Elia Feinstein. Many people don't realize that the Feinsteins and the Salomachis are actually related to each other. And as every little boy wants to oppress his grandfather, he was dabbling out loud and saying each word, and of course he was a genius, so he knew the meaning of the words. He was only six years old. He knew the meanings of the words. And he's crying out, Shema Kaleinu, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem, please listen to our voice, Chuz Barachim Aleinu, have compassion on us. And then the next blessing, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem, return and come back to us. Vin Hashuva, then we will do Tshuva. And he's saying it very loud, and he's hoping that his grandfather recognizes what kind of little tzadikal he is. And then they come to the next blessing, and this blessing he didn't say with such fervor. Do not cast me away to old age. Because when our powers wane, don't forsake us. And the Zaydi, Rabbi Alia Prusina, noticed that this Pasuk he didn't say with such intensity. <laughs> so after the doubting, he goes over to him and he says, Aaron, I noticed that there was one Pasuk that you didn't say with such enthusiasm. So the little boy smiles. He said, Zadie, I'm only six years old. You know, this is not uh, relevant to me. Listen to what the great Rabbi Yudha Prishna said. He said, there's no question that the words literally mean that we ask Hashem not to cast us away when we get older. But there's a deeper meaning. There's the mindset of an old person. There are young people that have the mindset of an old person that get burned out. And that's what we're asking. When we are young and we are vibrant, and we've spent a lot of time doing many wonderful things, many people get burned out. They say, okay, I've done enough. Let somebody else carry the road. Let somebody else carry the load. I'll touch the thing and do not cast us away. Let you think to that mindset of old age. No yet. No matter what age you are, whether it's 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80, or like Joe Tannenbaum was, Joe Kirsten was, never ever to lose that excitement to life. Never ever to be cast to that mindset of old age. That's what it's all about. 
And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Rekindling the passion within us. Every one of us, no matter what age, we can never let that flame go down within us. I'll tell you an amazing thing. A number of years ago, there was an Agudas Yisrael convention and the guest speaker was Diane Erntroy, a brilliant Tamil Chacham from London. By the time he got up to speak, it was after midnight. He really couldn't speak that long. He spoke maybe 12 minutes. But I will never forget what he said, and every time we meet each other, we discuss what he said that night. He said, he repeated an insight from the Shem Mishmoyah, the Sabbath Chavah Rebbe. The Pasuk tells us in the Torah, Ba'hi kasher yolda rochel es yosef. When Rochel gave birth to Yosef, Ba'yoyna Yaakov, the Lohan, Yaakov says to Lohan, Okay, Shachani, now you can send me, Ba'elcha el mokoyim ma'arsi. Now I can go back to my land, I can go back to my place, I can face the world. So the Sofa Chavah Rebbe asked, all of a sudden, just because he had Yosef, now he feels confident that he can face the world? What about when he had Yehuda? All Jewish kings, except for Sholem Allah, came from Yehuda. What about when he had Levi? All the Kahnim and the Levim came from Levi. What about when he had Yisachar? All the time the Chachomim came from Yisachar. The Rebbeim came from Shimon. What's so special about Yosef? And the Shem Shemuel says something terrific. He says it has to do with his name. Yosef means to add, never to be satisfied with the status quo, always to want more. And that's what Yaakov was telling Lohan. Once I have a child who will never be satisfied with the status quo, who will always try to improve, always want more, always to be better, that's the one that I can face the world with. That's the same idea that the other Prussian I was talking about. Never to have that mindset of old age that you don't want to grow anymore. We have to rekindle the flame within us so that every day we want to grow, that every day we want to accomplish, and every, one, every day we want to be like Yosef, that vida, that characteristic of Yosef, adding and doing more. Some of the women surely know the name of Zahaba Bronstein, Allah Shalom. Rebetzin Zahama Bronstein, in my opinion, was perhaps the greatest, or one of the greatest machanchos, machanachas, that we had in America. A wonderful teacher, a wonderful role model, a wonderful principal, a wonderful speaker, just a very, very special person. I had the opportunity many, many times to speak on the same program with her. And I remember she once told me a story the Bronstein family was very close to Rav Shlomo Freifeld. Rav Shlomo Freifeld was that charismatic Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva Shari Yosher, a Tamil of Rav Hutner. And the Bronsteins had made a chasana. And they wanted to have the Sheva brothers where Rav Shlomo Freifeld would attend, but he was not well anymore. And he said to the Bronsteins, I can't leave my home, but if you come to my house, even if you come for breakfast, we'll sit around the kitchen table, we'll have Sheva brothers, and then I'll speak for you. And that's what they did. The Bronsteins wanted very much that the Shlomo Freifeld should grace the Shema Brachas. And so one morning, they had a breakfast there, a million of people, and the Shlomo Freifeld spoke. And he told an amazing story. He told the story about the Kotzka Rebbe. The Kotzka Rebbe was a very sharp, brilliant individual. And he was visiting various Hadorim, Hadorim are little schools, where the boys learned Chumash. And he would fahar, he would test each of the boys in the school. And he comes to one school, and in this school they had just finished learning the Parsha of Horatius, not the Chumash Horatius, the Parsha of Horatius. And they were just finishing the Parsha when the Kotzka Rebbe walked in, and he said to one of the boys, Zog the Pasek, say the Pasek. And the little boy, in many of the Hasidic yeshivas, they learn in a sing song. So the little boy said, Vayechi Adam, Adam Agalept, Adam lived. And then it says, how many years he lived? 930, and he died. And then the next Pasek, Vayechi Shays, Shays Agalept, Shays lived. And it says, how many years? 
912, Vayamos, and he died, and his Gestorben. And the coach worker says, that's not how you say the Bosik. And the kid was surprised. That's how the Rebbe said it. He said, hey, don't know how say it again. The little boy says again, with the song, Vayachi, Odom, 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 Vayamos, and his Gestorben, and he died. And the coach says, that's not how you say it. And how even the Rebbe was surprised, because the kid was saying it exactly how the Rebbe said it. So the Kotzka said, I'll show you how you say it. By he, a galad! By Yomos, is he sure? By a he, and he lived! By Yomos, and he died. And then Rabbi Freifeld said something genius. He said, that's the shot, that's the meaning of what Dr. Amalek said. Loy Yomos, Kiev, yeah. The simple meaning that Dr. Amalek is saying. Loy Yomos, I will not die, rather I will live. But I saw from my say, God, I will tell over the glories of Hashem. Rav Shreifzal said, this is how you understand it. The word key has many meanings. It can also mean wild. Loy almost. I will not live a life of death. Key. Why? After while I'm alive. There are many people that are dead while they're alive. They go through the motions. They get up, they watch the bus, they die, they eat, they come home. They don't accomplish anything. They don't do anything for anybody. It's not a life. That's death and life. Life needs to accomplish. Life needs to grow. Loy almost. King Yahya, what a genius shot. I will not live a life of death. King Yahya, while I'm alive. Every one of us, before we have to go to sleep, before we go to sleep at night, has to think, what did I do today? Did I enhance Kuala Yisrael today? Did I enhance the life of somebody else? Or just look for myself? That's not good enough. That's not what Hashem put us in this world for. Hashem put us in this world to be like Yosef, to accomplish and to do more. So what's the answer? How do we do it? And I think the answer is excitement and enthusiasm. And I remember one time, I was in Antwerp, and I met the Rosh Hashim there, Rabbi Yehuda Trigger, and he told me an amazing thing. David Amalek writes in the longest chapter of Tilak, very goofy test. Those of you who are familiar with it know there are eight psukim with Aleph, eight psukim with Beis, eight psukim with Gimel. And one of the psukim that has to do with Ches, it says like this. Chashti, Dona says, I hastened. Delay is my motive. I didn't delay. Lish my mitzvahs have to do your mitzvahs. So Rav Traeger asked, if he said he hastened, why did he have to say, I didn't delay? He hastened. And he didn't delay. Why did he have to repeat himself? So Rav Traeger said, sometimes you see a guy who's running to shul. You say, wow. He's so excited to get the shoe. Hey, it's a that, of course. The guy's a lazy good for nothing. He woke up 25 minutes late. That's why he's rushing. <laughs> <laughs> you see, a guy's running to make the train. Think, oh, he's so excited to get to work. Of course not. He woke up 25 minutes late. Dr. Amela says, Hash, the I hasten. Who are you, son? But that because I delayed. Now, I told this over once. And a Hasidish guy came over to me. He says, I got to tell you what the Bob of Rebbe said. Now, I never heard the Bob of Rebbe say this, but it's so adorable that it's worth repeating anyway. The Rebbe said, according to the Chosid, that when the alarm clock goes off at 6.30 so that you should get up and be in show by 7, that's the call, call Yaakov. That's the voice of Yaakov. When you put your hand on the snooze alarm, you should sing 20 more minutes. That's your night and day, Aesop. That's the hands of Aesop. So whether he said it or not, I don't know, but it's adorable. But I'll tell you something interesting. I remember, as a teenager, I always enjoyed writing. My mother was the one who got me into writing. All the writing that I've done is only because of her. We always spoke about how important it is. The first sentence. Rabbi Levine can tell you he's a writer, a smart. The first sentence of a sefer, the first sentence of an introduction of a composition, an essay is very important. Because there's so many things to read. So if the first sentence grabs you, then the reader's going to go on. So I wanted to see for myself how did the tour, the tour was the son of the Rosh from Yaakov, he started the Code of Jewish Law, he started the Shulchan Aruch. How did he start the Shulchan Aruch? The Shulchan Aruch has within it, we know, four divisions, Arachayim, Chayshemishpah, Geredeh, Ebenezer, 1,704 different Simonet and Shulchan Aruch. Thousands and thousands of laws. How do you start that? What do you write to get somebody interested to learn Shulchan Aruch? Now, you can understand the tour knew every Gemara, every Pasuk, every Mishnah, every marriage. So he could choose from a lot. Listen to what he chose. It's a Mishnah in Ovis. 
Yehuda ben Tema Oime, Yehuda ben Tema says, Hebe az kanomer, be bold like a leopard, kal kanesher, swift like an eagle, rot skatsvi, run like a deer, give our diary, be strong like a lion, last face, return to be chashem hashemayim, to do the will of your Father in heaven. Imagine that's how we started the Torah of Jewish law. That's how we started the Torah of Jewish law. Rod's got three, run like a deer, give our curry, strong like a lion, enthusiasm, excitement. That's what it's all about. And when I saw this, I tell you, it made such a deep impression on me because of something that happened in my teenage years. When I was a teenager, I lived for camp. My whole winter was just based around when am I going back to camp Alberta to be in Colorado or to be on that baseball field. All I lived for a whole year was camp Alberta. And one year, around Purim time, I must have been about 16, my father says to me, this year you're not going to camp. I couldn't believe it. I, I thought maybe Hans for we couldn't afford camp or something, like what happened? I said, Pa, how come? you know, I love camp. He says, no, you're going to do something better than camp. I said, there's nothing better than camp. What can be better than camp? He said, I'm sending you to Eretz Yisra. Now, this is 1964. So it's before the Six Day War, before everybody went to Israel to learn in yeshivas and girls in the seminaries. Today we take it for granted. But in 1964, very few people went to Israel. I pictured in my mind Israel farmland, like the Midbar, at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's how I pictured Israel. So I'm not sending you to Israel. because there's a Knesset of the Torah. There's a gathering of all the tzaddikim, all the rabbis, all the Rosh Hashimahs, they're all coming together. And you're an enthusiastic kid, I want you to take your tape recorder, tape recorder. If you remember those, the real to real, you know, like the full box, right? You know, no cassettes, no MP3s, what was that? Just a big full box, you know, with real to real. You're gonna go, you record all the speeches, and then I'm gonna you're gonna stay another few extra weeks, go to their houses and take pictures of them and record them, become friendly with them. I said, Are you serious? He said, Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> and I went. It was amazing. It was amazing to see. That was the first time that I saw Rav Shalom Shabbat on the Magid of Yerushalayim. Rav Moshe Feinstein was there. Rav Kreisworth was there from Antwerp. Rav Chasm Sara was there. The Rosh Hashim Abcherem. All the great people. Rav Elia Lafian. All these great tzaddikim were there. Each one was speaking. Oh, thank you so much. And then, in those days, if you're old enough to remember, in 1964, very few people had telephones in Eretz Yisrael. Today, everybody has three cell phones. But and then, nobody, if you wanted to make a call to America, you had to make a, an appointment in the post office. As, and then to figure out, you know, the time frame. When can you be in the post office, right? And when you have seven hours back in, in, in America to make a call. It was just too complicated for a teenage kid who wanted to see the whole country. And I, for two months, I didn't speak to my parents. But we wrote letters every single day. I still have those letters that I got from my father. I treasure them. One day he writes me a letter. He says, you know, you're coming back soon. It's Elmo. I want you please to do me a favor. Please, I heard that there's somebody who goes around that he sings a song. He wakes up people for sleep. Says, Could you go 3, 4 o'clock in the morning and record it for me? I couldn't believe it. My father is expecting me to go to my boom box 4 o'clock in the morning and record a guy for sleep. I answered every letter except that one. <laughs> Four days later, I get a letter. Maybe the mail is not so good. I noticed you didn't answer me. Please, it would be so special if you would record that guy, that old man who goes and he sings the song and he wakes the people up for Christmas. Okay, so my father, it's the second time he wrote, he paid for my trip. I said, okay, fine, good, I'll go. So I went with somebody else because I was terrified. And those of you, Old enough to remember. Remember, we didn't have the old city then. We didn't have the Kais of our Does anybody remember how far the boundary was? There was a certain gate. Who knows what was the name of the gate? <laughs> Mandelbaum Gate. Right. That's where the Miri ship is today. That's as far as we had from Yerushalayim. The Mandelbaum Gate. So I go out 3 o'clock in the morning and 3, 4 o'clock and I'm trying to see where could this guy be in the Bukharian houses or something. And then at night, you know, the voice carries all of a sudden I hear somebody say, Stay for Snickers! Wake up for Snickers! I was thinking, that's what my father needs me to record? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what's the big deal? Anyhow, we, 
I'm going with my friend. And we start running to where the voice is. Now, this is a short little man who never sees anybody in the street at 4 o'clock. And two big, tall teenagers are coming with a head touch route, and they're running towards him. He is so terrified, the poor guy. He's like, he's not expecting anyone. He says, what's who do? Like, what do you want from me? I said, don't worry, I'm an American. That's the answer to all the Michigas. <laughs> I'm okay. You know, I'm an American. I, 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 got a, I said, listen, sir, I tell you Yiddish. I don't, know, I don't know if you know what this is, but this is called a tape recorder. And if you say something, you can actually play it back later on and hear the voice. And I said, you know, I'm going back to America in three days. And my father said, there's somebody who sings a song who wakes up people for sleepers. Do you know who that could be? And he looks me up and down and he says, Dos is beer. That's me. I said, that's you? I said, could you please do me a favor? It will mean so much to my father if you would sing that song and I'll record it and I'll bring it back to him. Again, he looks me up and down and he says, okay. Now, I am so embarrassed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway because you will never, ever forget this. You have to picture it is pitch black at night. The only light that you can see is the other side of the Jordan, the Mount Olive Hotel. And he goes like this. Yisrael am Kodesh Shtei Show you how old they are. 
There's an area called the Roman ruins. And you walk there, blocks and blocks of pillars of buildings that don't exist, stairwells into buildings that don't exist, courthouses, only a wall, nothing, but they should, they keep it there. It's the old ruins. They want to show that this is an ancient city. And there's one thing that is still there, but in its perfection. And I could not understand why would Hashem allow that to be in perfection. It's so embarrassing to Jews. And that is the Arch of Titus. Tonight, take a look at the Arch of Titus online. You'll see the most painful engraving on the top of that Arch of Titus, which is 50 feet high, built for Titus by his brother. Titus was the one who helped destroy the second base of Bidosh. He killed so many Jews. And in that grave you have broken Jews and they're carrying out the Menorah. Millions, millions of visitors see it every year. Why would Hashem allow it to be there? So embarrassing to all of us that this Russia, this Titus, made us carry out the Menorah into, into Golos, into the diaspora. And the more research I did, I remember I heard a story that in 1953, the Pont Bajorov went to this arch. Some say you're not allowed to walk under the arch, so he stood alongside and he said, Titus, Titus, you thought you were going to defeat us. You didn't defeat us. Today there's no Roman Empire. Nobody cares about Titus. But the Jews are all over the world. And we're growing and prospering. And then I heard a story about an American correspondent, the Jewish fellow, who was reporting about Hadrian's Wall. Some of you may know Hadrian and the Gemara was Agriotus. He killed Rabbi Akiva. And he went to report on Hadrian's Wall, which is in the northern part of England, near the River Tyne, near Newcastle. And Hadrian, they built a long wall for him, and this guy is reporting. He sees people are taking more stones from it, nobody cares about it anymore. And somebody goes over to him and says, Oh, you're Jewish? You know there's a Jewish neighborhood around here? Religious neighborhood? He said, Oh, I didn't know that. He said, would you like to see it? He said, yeah, why not? And whoever this was, this was a genius, who took him to Gateshead and he brought him into the house of the Rosh Hashim, <coughs> Rabbi Leib Horowitz. Rabbi Leib sees in a second that this guy knows nothing about Yiddish guy. He says, come with me, I want to show you something. And he brings him into the gates of his marriage. Rabbi Yosef Solomon told me he still remembers the day that Rabbi Leib brought in this American correspondent into the base marriage. He just didn't remember if the correspondent said a Kaddish or not, they let him in the Kaddish. But the guy never saw my Spanish. So much noise, big books, little books about the shelves, about the shelves. Guys, the other guys screaming back and forth. He said, Rabbi, what's going on here? How can you think here? And listen what Rabbi Lee says to him. Rabbi Lee said, you came to report on Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian killed Rabbi Akiva. Today there's no Roman Empire. Nobody cares about Hadrian anymore. But you see these 200 guys? They're still trying to figure out what Rabbi Akiva meant. And not only that, there's dozens of places around the world. Why? They're, and they're still trying to figure out in these places what Rabbi Akiva meant. And then I understood why Hashem left them. Why you see this? You know what? Not for the nations of the world, for us. Because Hashem has shown us that was the beginning of the journey. The beginning of the journey was when they carried out the Menorah. If we want to reach the end of the journey, which is Mashiach, we have to carry the Menorah. What does the Menorah represent? Kiner Mitzvah, the Torah. Kiner Mitzvah, every Mitzvah that you do is a candle. Every word of Torah that you learn is the ultimate light of Klal Yisrael. Only if we carry that banner of Kiner Mitzvah, the Torah, are we going to make it from the beginning of that journey after the second Mitzvah Midrash, all the way to Mashiach. So let me tell you a story about Mitzvahs. Now those of you who know me personally know that I was very, very close to my mother, La Shola. When I was 21, my father passed away. My mother was the quintessential almana, the quintessential widow for 40 long years. When my wife and I got married, we moved two blocks away from her. There was nothing that I didn't know about my mother. There was nothing that, you, that she and I couldn't discuss. And I was shocked this year, before Pesach, my nephew, Rabbi Yehuda Goodman, Woody Goodman, calls me up and he says, Uncle Pesach, I want to tell you something about Bobby, about your mother, that I never told you. It happened the last day of her life. And I never told it to you because I didn't understand it. But this year, he said, I'm a Rebbe in Edison, New Jersey, and I was teaching the boys something, and I saw something, and now I understood it, and I want to share it with you. I said, Woody, what is it? He 
says the last day of her life, you know, was the second day of Sukkot. It was in the morning, and he says, Bubby wasn't coherent anymore. She was in the Paul Kimball Hospital in Lakewood, and being that Woody lived in Lakewood, he stayed with her for those two days. He said it was the morning, and I said to her, Bubby, you want to shake the lulav and the esri? And she didn't respond. So I said, you know what, Bubby? Yeah, I'm going to put it in your hands. I'll put my fingers around yours. Let's say the bracha together. We'll say the blessing together, and we'll shake the lulav. And that's what I did. I put it in her hands, and then I put my fingers around hers, and I said the bracha. I don't know if she said the bracha or not, but I know that we shook the lulav. I moved it in all the different directions, the lulav and the esri. And then I wanted to take it away from her, and she wouldn't give it to me. She was holding on to it very tight. And I said, Bobby, well, we, we shook the little of, you want me to take it back? And she didn't do it. She held on to it. And then when I saw that she wanted to hold on to it, I moved my fingers away. And when she had it alone, she took the little of the esri to her lips. She kissed the little of, she kissed the esri, and she gave it back to me. He said, I never understood why she did that. He said, this year, I was teaching the children in Hilchas Afikai, and you could all look it up in her Chaim, Simon Tov, Ayan Zion, Aleph. Listen to what the Berhektiv says. Kosav Shlo HaKodesh. The Shlo HaKodesh, the Holy Shlo wrote. Ra'isi, I saw. Mibnei Aliyah, the higher echelon people in Kuala Yisrael. Shehoyum and Nashkin, they used to kiss the matzahs at the Seder. I never kissed the matzahs at a Seder until this year. And the Moror. Could you imagine they kissed the Mara? Vechen Sukkah, they would kiss the Sukkah. When they walked into the Sukkah, they kissed it like we kiss the Mezuzah. Vechen Sosoy, Uvin Tiyosim. When they go in and when they go out. Vechen, and also the Dalit Minim, the Lulav and the Esri, they would kiss it. Why? Vakol Lachavay, the Mitzvah, to show how much I love the Mitzvah. The Ashrei, and fortunate are those, Misha Oyvin Hashem Asimcha, who serve Hashem with happiness. He said, that's why she did it. Because she loved the mitzvah. And even though she may not have been as lucid to be able to say the bracha, but she knew she was holding a mitzvah. And I'll tell you the truth. I was so moved by it. I remember as a child, my mother kissed the little bit. I always did. But to kiss the matzah, to kiss the martyr, which is bitter. So I went around telling everybody this. Somebody showed me. Rav Kutner says, you know why you kiss the martyr? It's the only Rav that could come up with this. To show Kabbalah's Yisur Ba'ala that even, God forbid, if somebody has to suffer in some way, God, whatever you tell me, I'm ready. I'm ready to accept it. That's why you kiss the mark. Tell you the truth, I couldn't kiss the mark. Whatever. But I certainly kiss the matzah. And all my kids kiss the matzah. And that's amazing. Because when you show your child that you love doing mitzvahs, <coughs> they don't want to do mitzvahs. You don't have to teach and tell a child to love a mitzvah. You love it. If I gave you tickets to the Jays playoff game, you would watch those tickets. And your kids would know. You're not letting those tickets out of your sight. So they know what you love. You don't have to explain it to them. They see what you love. The way you hold a sitter, the way you hold a chumash, the way you kiss it, the way you kiss your talus and your tefillah, or the way you bench lift, the love that you have for a mitzvah, that's all we have to show our children. I brought all of you a gift. Tonight, when you go out on the tables, all of you will be able to take something that is so precious. Listen to this. One of the places that we go to when we go to Europe, of course, is to the concentration camps. And a number of years ago, there was a woman, a 101-year-old woman, Irma Haas. She lived in Washington Heights. She moved to Israel when she was 97. And then when she passed away, and People went through her papers. They sent her papers to a niece of hers, Judy Marcus, the teenager. And Judy Marcus saw the most unbelievable thing, a prayer that a rabbi wrote in Bergen-Belsen. And he gave it out to all the people. It was handwritten. And they made somehow, he was able to either make copies or people said it. And now it's printed. All of you will be able to take it home tonight. I thank Shlomi for making the copies. This is what it looks like. It's on the table. Listen to how a rabbi, his name was Rabbi Yisachar Davids. He was the rabbi of Rotterdam in Holland. And he knew everybody in the concentration camp was going to have to eat hummus. There was no matzah to be had. 
to listen to the love of doing a mitzvah to the pain of having to violate a mitzvah. I'll read it to you and I'll translate. And I tell you, when you take this home, I know many people that I give it out to on the trip, they tell me, Rabbi Kroll, we laminated it and we kept it on the Seder table and we read it to our children and grandchildren so we should know how fortunate we are today that we live either in Canada or in America or in England, that we have a freedom that we should never, ever take for granted. Listen to this prayer. He writes, Before you eat chametz, say this with great intensity. Our Father in Heaven, You know that we want to do Your will. And You know that we want to celebrate Pesach and eating matzah. And of course, not to eat chametz. But what should we do? Our hearts are breaking because we have the servitude of these people over us. And now our lives are in danger. And now we want to fulfill the mitzvah of a Bohem. You told us in the Torah that we should do everything to stay alive. But why should you? It's not that we should die. Therefore, we are observing you told us to watch our souls. Our king, therefore, Tefillah, saying of our prayer is, please keep us alive. That we should be able to do your will. Imagine the broken hearted people before they had the comments, they would say this to me. That shows what a mitzvah is. That shows what a love is. That shows what a concern is. That shows what the pain of a sin is all about. Take it tonight. Read it. Whether you're laminated and put it on your Seder table, that's a different story. It's up to you. But this is what Jews are all about. This is what enthusiasm of a mitzvah is all about. You know, there's a fascinating, a fascinating morale. The morale tells us something about a word that all of us have said thousands of times in our lives. When we say Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echot. God is one, but he says, you know what Echot stands for? It's so amazing. Aleph is one. He says, you know, Aleph is the prime. Who is the prime one of the patriarchs? He said it was Yaakov. You know why? Because Avram, unfortunately, had a son like Ishmael. Asa, unfortunately, had a Yitzchak had a son like Asa. But Yaakov, all his 12 children, what's that thinking? Aleph is Yaakov. Ches are the eight children that he had with his two wives. Who did he have with his two wives? Leah, Rachel, Ruben, Shemite, Levi, Yehuda, Yisach, Zulun, Yisif, and Yaman, that's eight. And David are the four children that he had with the maid servants, with Bill of Zilpa, God, Asher, God, Naftali. So he says, Echad, we are all one. Aleph is Yaakov, because he was the primary one of the boys of the patriarchs. Ches and David, the 12 children, we're all one. We're all brothers and sisters. We have to care for each other. We have to love each other. We have to be tolerant for each other. So I want to show you, I'm telling you again, on these trips, when we go to the river of Elimelech of Lezhensky, it, it, it's impossible to describe what it is to dominate, to pray there. To me, it's like praying at Kei It is so holy, you get so involved, it is so amazing. And I tell the people on the bus, there's a big plaque when you walk in that has the prayer that the Reverend of Elimelech made up. And I say to everyone, don't say it until we're in there together. And we go in together, it's a building now, they, took, they built a building around his grave site, and I put the men on one side and the women on the other side, and we start saying the prayer. And it's written in a very light Hebrew so everybody understands it. And then we come to this part. And this part already has now become a very famous song. Adarabah, just the opposite. Tain Bilebeinu, give it to us in our hearts. Shalira, kol echot, maylas chavarinu. We should see the virtues of each other. Belaychas vayna. And not our faults. And I tell the people, that's what I believe you have to react to my faith. What does it mean, love your neighbor like yourself? It's impossible in my mind that God meant that somebody should love anybody else the way they love themselves. It's impossible. God could not have asked that from us. All the commentaries ask this question. You know what I believe the answer is? Why do you love yourself? Tonight, look at the mirror. You know why? Because you only think about the good things that you do. You're proud of all the good things you do, so you love yourself. You don't forget the negative. Do you have to love your neighbor? Come on, you like you love yourself. Nobody's perfect, but everybody has good, and you look at the good in your life, that's why you love yourself. Love somebody else, but look at your good. That's what it means, we have to.
And I love what Rav Shamsham Soler says. It doesn't say, be a hot dog, I love your friend. Live me. Everything about your friend. His reputation, his finances, his family. Everything. Live me. Everything that belongs to your friend, you've got to love. Just like you're worried about your reputation, you're worried about your family, you care about somebody else's family. In the totality, it's not just that individual. Live the Yacha, everything about them. So I want to tell you a great story. Two great stories. What does it mean when you care for somebody else? In Muncie today, there's a great town of His name is Rabbi Salo Rudinsky. There's a big, beautiful yeshiva and a beautiful shul. So last year, he was giving a Shabbat shul in Russia. We know that. The great Rabbanim, many hundreds and hundreds of people come to hear that lecture between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Shabbos, which is called Shabbos Shuvah. I've been in that base fetish many times. I've done prison there. I've spoken there. It's a big place. All the swarm are lined up on the shelves at the back. And he's in the middle of this fantastic drasha, and he wants to quote a Rashi in Yeshaya from the prophet Isaiah. Now, one of the high school boys was standing in the back, and he points to the boy and says, can you bring me up in your shot? I want to pull the verse inside, the Rashi inside. The little kid turns around, takes the shot off the shelf, and he brings it forward. Robert Radinsky opens up the safer, turns the pages, and he reads the verse, he reads the bus, and he reads the Rashi. And he goes on with the speech. Afterwards, somebody comes over and says, Rabbi, that Pussy, that verse in your shot was so terrific. And Rashi, come with it, could you show it to me? He said, get me a shot. So what do you mean get you a shy? Didn't the kid get you a Yeshaya? He said, no. He was so nervous. He turned around. He saw a Yud on the Sefer. It was Yechesko. But, but, you know, he was so nervous. He brought it up in front of 700 people. Can I tell him in front of 700 people that he brought the wrong Sefer? The poor kid would never forget it for the rest of his life. So I just opened it up. I turned a couple pages. And I read the Pasuk as much as I remembered it by heart on the Rashi. But if you want to see it, you got to go bring me a Yeshaya. That's the battle. That's a man of the heart. That's someone special. That's what it's all about. I'll tell you another story that I just heard in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Sao Paulo, Brazil is a very, very dangerous place. I mean, I, I don't understand how people live there. I'll tell you the truth. You cannot walk into a shul there just from the outside. You walk into a little room, they lock the door on this side, on this side, they look at you at a, on a video, make sure you're not a terrorist, and then you can go in. You can't walk into a school. You can't walk into an apartment building from the street. You walk into another room. The guards are watching you front and back, and then you pass through. So it's a dangerous place. But they have many, many wonderful people there. Many Sephardic Jews. As a matter of fact, there's a Sephardic Cuba organization. It's called Macom, and they had a 10th annual dinner, and they asked me to come to speak. Rabbi Shlomo Sarah, after the dinner, a guy Charles on the comes up to me and says, Rabbi, I've got a great story for you. Please, let me drive you to where you're staying, and you'll see, you'll print this story. I hear this every single day, twice on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and after somebody tells me a story, the guy usually says, you want to know how to spell my name? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a nice guy, I listen to everybody. But you only print those that are incredible. And this is incredible. Charles tells me that 10 years ago, he was somewhat religious, not as religious as he is today because of this organization, but his parents were not religious. And they lived 75 miles away from San Paulo in a place called Guarujá. Now, anybody from Brazil will tell you Guarujá is the most gorgeous area. It's 75 miles away. It's near the port city of Santos. And his parents had a beach home there. And they said, why don't you come for Shabbat? This is synagogue not far. We know you like to go to the synagogue on Shabbat, but like this, you'll be with us for Shabbos. Now he knew 75 miles, it wasn't the superhighway, it's one lane this way, one lane back. You better have a full tank of gas. Because if you stop on that highway, that's the end. That's the last stop. Bandits <coughs> on the road, carjackers, it's, it's horrible. And they're just slum areas along favelas, they're called, along the way, the 75 mile route. He told me to make sure that he had a full tank of gas. He's driving 60 miles at the end, about 75 miles away. All of a sudden, he gets a flat tire. Oh my goodness, how's he going to fix it? He doesn't know how to fix a flat. This Charles told me I didn't know what I was going to do. I was afraid to get out of the car. But I had no choice. I got out of the car. Of course, nobody stopped for me. They thought maybe it was like a ruse. 
that I'm just trying to get down on our of somebody. So I said, Hashem, please help me that I shouldn't come late for Shabbat. I've got to fix this flat. I don't know what to do. He gets in the car. He decides he's going to drive to the slum area, the first one. He comes there maybe a minute later. He's driving very slowly. There's one of them, the rim of the tire. And he comes in, a poor slum area. All the little boys and girls are coming around him. And the cats and the dogs and guys are out shirts. like real low-life people. I said, what are you doing here? And of course, they all speak Portuguese. He said, I gotta get to Guanajá. Is anybody can fix a flat here? I'll pay you anything you want. They couldn't fix it. And then he told me he saw a car that looked like 30 years old. He said, whose car is that? And the guy without the shirt says, it's mine. Why, what's the difference? He said, listen to me. I will pay you anything. I trust you. I'm gonna leave my car here until Sunday morning. Just get me to Guanajá before sunset. How much you'll pay? And they made it a deal. And he, he says, okay, let me get my shirt. He says, there's no time. Get in the car. We gotta go right now. <laughs> Okay, so the shirtless guy is driving down this one-lane highway, and they begin talking. And finally, he says to them, you know, I, I just want to tell you, like, why I'm rushing. See, I don't know if you ever saw a Jew in your life, but, see, I'm Jewish, and we believe God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, you rested, and it starts Friday night. So I got to get to a job before sunset. I can't be driving in a car before sunset. So the driver without the shirt says, oh, you don't think I ever saw a Jew? I'm not Jewish, but my mother's Jewish. <laughs> he said, your mother is Jewish. Now, you want to tell him that means you're Jewish, but you don't, you don't throw them out of God. He said, what do you mean your mother's Jewish? He says, well, at the end of the 1930s, you see, my mother was born in Holland. And they realized that it was very bad for the Jews. So my grandparents, they got on a boat. And if you take a look, you'll see boats came from Germany and from Holland. They came to Brazil. And my my Grandparents didn't want to have anything to do with Judaism. So they stayed in Santos, the fourth city. They put her in a Catholic school. She married a Catholic guy. So me and my brothers and sisters were all Catholic, but my mother's Jewish. Like he just don't want to say. He says, is your mother still alive? She says, yeah, as a matter of fact, she's in a hospital in Santos. She's dying, she's very sick. Now, what would we say? Think about it. If you heard that comment, what would you say? Oh, she should feel well. Right? You know what he said? Can I go visit her Sunday morning? This guy couldn't believe it. You want to visit my mother? You don't even know her. No, but we're Jews. And Jews stick together. And if your mother's not feeling well, she's dying, I would like to go see her. He says, I don't believe you. He says, I used to be. He said, I'm telling you, I want to He tells him she's on the third floor of bed tent. It's a dumpy place. And he gets her. He gets him to water John time. Now listen to this. Charles is so sensitive. He told me, I felt so bad. Because now I know the guy's Jewish. And he's driving back on Shabbos. I feel bad. But he couldn't tell me anything. Because it wasn't going to make a difference. Sunday morning, he comes into this hospital. And he comes into the third floor bed tent. He says, is anybody here Maria? And she says, yeah, that's me. Well, who are you? He says, you don't know me, but you have a wonderful son who's got the same name as me, Charles. And he helped me on Friday. And he's a wonderful boy, a wonderful young man. And they get into a conversation, and once he warms up in the conversation, he said, Charles, your son told me you're Jewish. Isn't that true? He said, your my son told you I'm Jewish. Why did he tell you that? <laughs> he said, because I told him that I'm Jewish. She said, yeah, I really am Jewish. And he says to her, do you remember anything about your being Jewish when you were a child? And she closes her eyes and she says like this, Baruch Ato Hashem, perfect Hebrew, Elokeinu, Melech Oilom, Asher Kiddushonu, B'Mitzvisa, B'Tzivonu. And she starts crying, she can't stop crying. She can't get the words out of how the Keshul Shabbos. She's just crying and bawling because it brings back the memories of her youth. And finally she says, and he says, Maria, how do you know that? You said it perfectly. She said, my abuela, my grandmother used to light candles with me every Friday night. I used to love doing it. You think I believe all this stuff that my parents made me go and they let me, made me go to a Catholic school? I believe in only one God. I don't believe in anything that they told me. But my parents forced me, they sent me to that school, so I married somebody from that faith. 
but I don't believe any of that. He said, please, Maria, I want to be your friend. Can I come visit you when you come out of the hospital? She says, please, that would be so nice of you. And Charles told me two weeks later, she called and said, please come visit. And when he came to the house, there was a big crucifix on the outside, a cross. And when he came into the house and he was alone with her, he said, Maria, you told me you don't believe in anything that they taught you. Why do you have the crucifix? She says, you think I want it there? I don't want it there. I wish you would take it. He says, you really want me to take it? He says, please, I don't believe in any of that. I only believe in one God. And he takes it, and he told me that when he broke it in the car, he felt he was being kind every day in the lane when I think of this. To remove idols from the land. Where, where do we have idols today? But he felt when he broke it. And then two weeks later, she died. And when I told the story to my Reverend Rabbi David Cohen, he said, look at that. What would we have done? Would any of us have gone to visit that lady? But look at this. Because he did the mitzvah, Biko Chayla, he visited the city, he brought her back to Chuba. He brought her back to a declaration that she has, she believes in only one God. Who knows, maybe before she closed her eyes for the final time, she said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echol. How did that happen? Because the love of the mitzvah, the love of doing Biko Chayla, that's what it's all about. I want to tell you something that happened a few weeks ago. Some of you may know part of this story, but I want to tell it to us, I want to tell it to all of you, because it is just so mind-boggling, it's absolutely amazing. In the five towns in New York, there's a woman, her name is Lori Martin. Lori Martin, many years ago, 10 years ago, had a daughter, Sabrina, who was very sick. And the women, the wonderful women of the five towns of Park Rockaway, they wanted to do something for her benefit. And so they decided they would come to Lori's house every morning, they would say the brothers out loud, Everybody would say Amen, and hopefully that would be a merit for Sarah. But unfortunately, she was so sick already, and she passed away. So they renamed this group called the Ohel Sarah, named after Sarah, Amen group. They've been doing it for 10 years. Three months ago, Lori Martin's other daughter, who's married with twin little girls, she was in Miami. She's walking with her husband. She says, I don't feel well, and she faints. And she falls into a deep, terrible coma. <coughs> Atsola took her to a hospital in Miami. She was so fragilely alive that they couldn't even do an MRI or a CAT scan. And they called Lori and her husband, Dr. Freddy. They said, come down and say goodbye to her. She's brain dead. You'll never be able to speak to her. You'll never be able to, to, to see her again. Come down. You've got to come down to say goodbye. And Lori comes down. She's saying, till them there, the children, the siblings are coming down. They're all crying. And after two months, they were, after a month rather, they were able to bring her to Long Island Jewish Hospital in New York. She was there for another month. And then some of the women called me, Mrs. Corrine Hughes, and she said, you know, could you take us to the gravesite of Rabbi Yaakov Yasef? Rabbi Yasef, he was the Rav HaKola, he was the Rav of 18 shuls in the early 1900s of New York. And many people go to pray at his gravesite. And his yard site was coming up. I said, listen, there's too many people that go on his yard site. I can't. There's too many people. You can't really pray there. If you want to go a few days earlier and go by some of the other rabbis that are buried in the cemetery next, I'll tell you we can pray. She discussed it with the women. They said, okay, we'll do it. Three weeks ago, Thursday morning, it is so hot. And all these women come and we all meet. And I say to them, normally you're not allowed to eat in the cemetery, but I'm begging every one of you to take water and do not stop drinking. Because you can get dehydrated, it is so hot. And we go to Rav Palm, and I tell them stories about Rabbi Palm, and I tell them stories about Rabbi Akhamadetsky. And then we go to Rav Hanach Leibowitz. Rav Hanach Leibowitz was the Rosh Hashiva of Chavetz Chaim. And I say to them, to me this is the serious because Rav Hanach had no children. But he loved all the students like his children. He loved the students, and every single time without fail, that I was the one, and Rav Hanach was the Sandik, right before the bris, the baby was on his lap already, he'd call over the father, and we'd say, listen, I want to give you a blessing that you should build, you should be a, your son should be a marvelous Torah, he should spread Torah. And today the Chavetz Chaim guys are such a wonderful guy. Vancouver, Cherry Hill, unbelievable, they don't stop, it's amazing. And we're praying there, and I told them to say chapter 23, Chavetz because the Pesach says over there, Gam ki eilech, begates our mothers, 
Even though we walk in the shadow of death, I will not fear because you are with me. We're just about finished saying that chapter, and I say to everybody, okay, we're going to go now to the Chum Times wife. But all of a sudden I hear a scream. A scream is screaming. And then all the other women are screaming. Now I want to tell all the men, no man can scream like a woman. I want you to know that. And not only that, when women scream together, no man can come to them. It is unending yelling, and she, I don't know what they're screaming about. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, somebody fainted and fell on a rock or fell on a monument. And I don't know, I don't know what, and, and yet go on so long, it's still dangerous. And everybody's running there. So of course I also ran there. And everybody's yelling, she's on the phone. She's on the phone. I said, who's on the phone? I saw her. She said, no. The daughter, she just came out of the coma. Lori's on the phone talking to her. I said, what are you talking about? I go to Lori. I said, I've been talking to your daughter. She says, here's the phone. I said, Raquel, is that you? She says, yeah. I said, how do you feel? She said, well, gosh, I'm fine. <laughs> I said, are you serious? And she had just come out of the coma while we were praying by the gravesite of a better place, which was unbelievable. And all the women are crying and kissing and hugging each other. I'm just sitting there like this. You know, I'm, I'm just watching this thing. I'm not part of that. And, and then finally, Glory says, we got to say Mishmas. And they start saying Mishmas. And if you read the words of Mishmas, I can know the, the meaning of the prayer. It is so poignant. I'm telling you, it was like Mishmas on Yom Kippur. It's amazing. And then I said, we're going to go back to Rapenna. It's Kippur. We have to go to his website and say, you could look. Kuf, which is Bismal Hassan is saying thank you, it happened by him. And then later in the day, somebody said to me, You know why you come up by Rapena? Because you know who this girl, Raquel Katz, you know who she is? She's the granddaughter of Harry Hirsch, who was a famous skater in New York. He was a student by Rapena. He supported Rapena Sishiva of its time. So it happened there for a reason, it didn't happen just plain. And then finally, we went to, to Rabbi Yaakov Yezid, and one of the women said to me, Rabbi Kron, we don't want to leave here. We don't want to leave. We just saw a miracle. Tell us, what, how do we, what do we make out of this? And I said, put something in my head, I have no idea where it came from. And I said to them, I want to tell you this, three words in the English language that have no meaning next to each other, but they all begin with the same Hebrew letters. Nais is a miracle, Nutsan. Nais is a flag that's on top of a flagpole. These sonyoin, the test, begins with Nun and Sama. What's the connection? Why did God test Abraham of Evil? He loved them. If you love someone, you don't test them. You no, know, the answer is because he knew he would pass the test. And when somebody passes the test, he's on a higher Ramah. He's on a higher level. I said, every one of you today passed the test. It was so hard. There was no reason that you should come. It's not your daughter, it's not your granddaughter. When you passed the test, you came to pray for somebody else's child. So you got, you became on a higher Ramah. You became on a high level. That's why you saw the miracle. That's the Nisoyim, that's the Nase, that's the Nase. I said, it's foolish for us to think only oh, because we pray. That's ridiculous. With an icing on the cake. But maybe God granted us because we went through the test and we passed the test. And when you pass the test, you become on a higher level. I just want to tell you just one more thing. And then we'll review and end with a great story. One of the things that's so important to teach our children and to read about it is stories of Ashkoha brothers, stories of godly orchestration of events that only God could have orchestrated it that way. And when you begin to teach your children these type of stories, and you read them in class, and you teach them at home at the Shabbos table, and you talk about it with your family, you see God is orchestrating every single second of the way. I want to give you two examples. Unbelievable. I heard it to the people themselves. There's a guy in Lakewood, you know what Chaveru is? Chaveru is somebody's locked out of a house, they'll get you in. Somebody constantly showed me, told me the most of they get the kids locked in the back of the car. And the mother forgot. Do you know that there are women now in Lakewood? They drive with one shoe in the back. They wear their right shoe because they drive it with that, but they leave their left shoe in the back because, like this, they'll remember they got a kid back there. It's hard to believe, right? It's amazing. Some people don't even leave their wallets there. I mean, what are you going to remember? Oh, your wallet, not your kid, your wallet. So, listen to this. The guy in Haber told me it was last year. Three day on the Shabbos, Sunday and Monday. Sunday and Monday were Shavuos. So Friday afternoon, an hour before Shabbos, 
A guy calls him up, he says, Yo, how He says, yeah, could you fix a flat? I'm stuck. Wait, man, where are you stuck? Route 9? You got the state? No, it's in my driveway. He said, a car's in your driveway. It's one hour for you under. Why are you calling? Why don't you just leave it to, to the left under? He says, no, I'm not so. I might need the car on the under. And he says, oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. I didn't even think of that. I feel so bad. I, myself, I'm finished dispatching soon. I'm going to come and fix your flat. I'm so sorry. It didn't even occur to me that you could be on top and you might need the car. He fixes the car. He told me he didn't even see the guy. He only saw the kid's son because this guy was hot solo. He was busy answering calls. Saturday night, the whole family is sitting and this guy comes here in his house and his mother-in-law is sitting at the table. All of a sudden, she falls back and her eyes like go into her head. And he realizes, oh my gosh, he's having a stroke. And somebody says, call that Sola. And who do you think comes to take his mother-in-law? That guy comes, the one that he fixed the flat for. And they ride to the hospital, and you know what the guy in the, in the hospital said? It's a miracle that you have this on Sola guy because he's the closest one to the hospital. You know, Cosmic Show, somebody has a stroke, every second counts as far as brain damage. So imagine because he fixed that guy's flat, he saved his mother-in-law's life. And most of the time, that's a good thing. <laughs> Let me tell you one more story you won't believe. There's a fellow, Schmelke Brazil. Schmelke Brazil learned by Ruth Reifeld. He opened now a yeshiva there. It's a very successful yeshiva. And he told me one of his time he one of the business, he was a traveling salesman, and he said, you know, the guy told him after a while, how much radio can you listen to? My gosh, the sports shows and the talk shows, it's just the same thing regurgitated every single day. How much can you listen to? I feel like we're drunk, we're stuck. <laughs> you know, how much can you listen to radio? Anyway, the point is he decided from now on he's only going to listen to Torah tapes, to Shura. And for whatever reason he decided he's going to listen to the Cloys and Regal Rebbe. So he gets CDs of the Toys and Regal Rebbe, and the second he gets into the car, he puts on his CD, and he's listening to these sure, to these Torah lectures. One day he tells Robert Brazil he's driving, and all of a sudden he didn't realize he was falling asleep. And suddenly he's a horn behind him, and it wakes him up, and he goes, oh my gosh, he's about to go into a guy who stopped at a red light, and he slams on the brake, and he misses the guy by a half an inch. Now, of course, the guy ahead of him didn't realize that he was going to hit him. So after the light, he goes on. Now he's just shaking. He can't believe it was almost in his accident. And he takes a look. There's no car behind him. There's no car on the right side. Where was the horn? What? Well, how did this horn happen? And then it occurs to him. He puts the CD back. He rolls it back. And he realizes the Remy was giving a shear near an open window. And somebody had blown the horn. And that was the horn that he heard on the shear. Could you believe it? And he said to Robert Brazil, only because I was learning Torah on the way, I was safe from getting into an accident. That's amazing. That's divine orchestration. And when you hear all these kind of stories, you get to believe there's a God who's watching us every step of the way. So let's review quickly. And we'll end with a fabulous, fabulous story which will change forever the way you say in the Sanatoka that meaningful prayer on Rosh Hashanah. Let's remember that Shoshana Amazing should change her name to Amazing. We thank again Shlomo, Shoshana, we thank the Christmas for putting together this great thing we wish Rabbi Shlomo. It's a great, great Hanslava. Let's remember what Rabbi Aaron Solovic, you heard from his uncle, let's not fall into that mindset of old age. Let's remember to be like Yosef that we want to add, always to accomplish. Let's remember what our Freifel told us. Why always ye here? I will not live a life of death while I am alive. Let's remember how the Shulchan Aruch starts. Rots not speed, keep our guy read. Run like a lion, be swift like an eagle, strong like a leopard to do the will of Hashem. Let's remember that our Jephthahs is there for us. Can their mitzvah return or we have to love mitzvahs? Like my mother loved that mitzvah full of an Esther, even though she was no longer coherent to say the Bracha. But she was lucid enough to be able to kiss that mitzvah and so such a great lesson to children and grandchildren. Let's remember that tefillah. Take that tefillah when you go home. 
keep it, read it in the Hebrew and in the English. Maybe keep it for your Seder to show children how fortunate we are today that we have freedom. Let's remember Echod that Aleph is Yaakov, one, the top. Casting down that the 12 children were all one. We have to love each other, care for each other like Robert Rodinsky cared for that little boy. And didn't embarrass him in front of everyone that he brought to home safer. Now Charles of the Mafia went to be with Akachayla, that lady, and brought her to Chuma. Let's remember you never ever give up davening. Just like my Lori Martin, all the women prayed, the woman is out of the coma, she still needs a great Yeshua. We should all daven for her high razor Mazdina, she still cannot see. She just started brushing her teeth with her left hand, but she still has to get moving back in her limbs. And let's remember to learn stories of divine orchestration on Shabbat brothers. I just want to end with this fabulous story. There is a fellow, Rabbi Philip Moskowitz. He's the assistant rabbi in Boca Raton. I had this supposed to be in Boca this past year. Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg has been there 10 years. They had a uh, 10 year celebration. Rabbi Shefter and I were the two guest speakers. But while I was there, Rabbi Philip Moskowitz told me this amazing story. He told me the story that he has a distant cousin who lives in Israel who is Masorati, but not Dati, who is a traditional Jew, but not a religious Jew. He didn't go to a yeshiva, but he went to a Jewish culture school, so he knows that there's such a thing as Gemara, he knows that there's such a thing as Shabbat, but that's about it. And he went to the army after his schooling. Now, unfortunately, today, the pressure on the Israeli soldiers is such that many of them, after they finish their tour of duty in the IDF, Israeli Defense Force, they go to foreign countries. Many of them go to Asia. That's why during the tsunami there were so many Israeli kids there. And many of them go to India. And this fellow went to India, and the longer he was away from Eretz Israel, the less religious he became, until he dropped everything. And one night he was sitting at a bar in Mumbai. And he's drinking with his friends. It's 8 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he hears the sound of a shaykh. Shafer is frightening. But when you're in a bar and won't buy that, that's the last thing that you're expecting. And he, he can't believe it. He, he runs outside of the bar. He's looking, ooh, ooh, Shafer. But there's so many people, it's so crowded there. He's standing outside the bar looking around. Then down the block, he hears it again. Somebody else is buying Shafer. He doesn't know who it is. He runs home. He opens up his calendar and he sees that it was Yom Kippur. And he made some calls and he found that it was a Chabad Shliach that was blowing Shafer at the end of Yom Kippur to tell everyone that the fast was over. Religious or non-religious, he wanted anybody to know they could eat or go back to work. This guy sat down on his bed and he could not stop crying. How could he have fallen so far? He didn't even know it was Yom Kippur. It was awful. He could not stop crying. The next morning, he picked up his bags, he packed his bags, and he went back to Israel. And he enrolled in the yeshiva. And for the next 10 years, he was a different yeshiva. He became a religious boy. He got married. He has children. And today, he is a regular balabas. He's a wonderful person. He's expecting his fifth child. I happen to know, since my research is this, I happen to meet his family. And Rabbi Moskowitz said something in genius. He said, that Chabad guy who blew chauffeur, he will never know how he influenced that fellow in the bar. And that fellow will never meet that Chabad guy who blew the chauffeur. He said, now I understand something a different way in that very poignant moving prayer that we say, I'm a Shoshana Yom Kippur. In the Sanatoyim we say, that at the end of 120 years, God and every one of us is going to have a private viewing. The Siftah has safe for us. God is going to open up the book of memories. Um, of you, Cody, it's going to read by itself. God's just going to press the button and you're going to see the video of your whole life. And this, all those things are going to be remembered. All those things that were forgotten. And then it says, the Chosem Yad called Odom Boy. The simple meaning is that everybody will sign off. 
But Rabbi Moscow had said it could have just said a chayis of yad adam. A person would sign. What's called adam? What is every person? He said, you know what it means. He said when they open up that Israeli soldier's book at the end of 120, no signature is going to be in there. That Chabad guy, because he influenced them. And that's what our role in life is: to try to sign the books of all those people that we can inspire, and to come close to people who can inspire us so their signatures are in our books. When we come in tonight at Eitzchayim, knowing that we're close to 100 years, and knowing that Joe Kersner and his Zadis and his uncles and all his family, how many signatures of the Kersners are in thousands of children's books after 120 years? Why? Because they made a difference. They inspired them. They made sure there was Jewish education. And that's what we come here tonight for. Not only to improve ourselves, but to improve each other. To sign other people's books. Because of Yad, call on the boy. Every person. And that's what we have to do between now, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Aziz, Shuba. Get close to those great people that can inspire you. So after 120 years, when we have that private viewing with Hashem, we're going to see their signatures in our book. That's what it's all about. Signatures, signing off. That's the bracha to all of us. Hashem should sign off for each and every one of us. That we should have a year of mazel, of blessing, of Yeshua's, which is salvation, and voice and healings, and only good. And that next year we should be able to have the Kersner lecture in Yerushalayim, and Akedish with Mashiach. And thank you for inviting me, and thank you.